Let's spend some time talking about virtual memory. We've been thinking of memory in fairly generic terms so far, just thinking of it as a monolithic place to store information in RAM. And we want to look at a little more detail about what's really going on under the hood. Virtual memory is really a kind of a caching mechanism. So when we think about caching in the traditional sense of the memory hierarchy, we know that we're bringing information from lower, larger, slower, cheaper levels of the cache into layers above that that are faster, smaller, and more expensive. And that's exactly what's going on with virtual memory. We want to be able to expand the memory space available to our programs beyond the physical limitations of the memory in RAM and allow us to store things out on a disk or even out across the network. So what we're going to see is that virtual memory allows us to access a very large space of memory even though we don't physically have that much memory in the machine itself. Here's a simple illustration of very simple physical addressing and this is not really characteristic of any modern processor. It was kind of the approach that was taken back in days of yore with early microprocessors and so forth. But the idea here basically is that we have the CPU chip itself and then there's just one core that I'm showing here. And then this section over here is an illustration of the memory. So we can see that memory is just an array of entries numbered from zero up to M minus one, where M is the capacity of our memory. When the CPU then wants to access an element in memory, it's going to put an address on the address bus that will include both the location and the size of the read in this case. And the memory system is going to respond by going to that location in memory and giving back that many bytes, say, and put that on the data bus and send that information back to the CPU. Very straightforward. The address that the CPU puts out is actually a reference to the physical storage on the machine. So we call this a physical address or a PA. And again, this is quite simple. It's really a strategy that's only used in things like microcontrollers that you might find in an elevator or a microwave oven or something like that. Um, really not used anymore in more sophisticated computer systems. So what we do use is virtual addressing. So this is something that's going to be used in any modern microprocessor and as I've got here on the slide, this is really one of the big ideas of computer science. The difference here is that in the case of virtual addressing, the CPU core, so this is now, this, I've broadened the scope of the CPU chip, the CPU core is actually going to issue addresses that are going to be now referred to as virtual addresses. So they're in a different address space that is then going to be mapped into a physical address. And the piece of hardware that's also located on the CPU chip that does that job is called the memory management unit. And we're going to unpack a little bit what the memory management unit or the MMU does in another talk. But you can see here that the CPU is working entirely in terms of virtual addresses. It issues an address. In this case, I've got 4100 as the address. The memory management unit then converts that into the location in physical memory where that virtual address is being stored. And in this particular case, it actually maps it back to address number four and tries to fetch back four bytes from that location, just as in the previous case, and then the values come back to the CPU. But note now that the CPU core is completely unaware of the actual address in memory of the values that it's asking for. This mapping between virtual addresses and physical addresses that's done by the MMU is completely outside the purview of the CPU. It just thinks it has an address space. The fact that those addresses are no longer stored in a simple linear array of bytes, as we've been assuming so far, is something that's completely hidden from the CPU. I've been using the phrase address space. Let's take a little time to look at what that actually means. Really, it's just this list of addresses. It's the indexes, if you will, that index into this array of bytes that we've been thinking of conceptually so far. It's always, in, in any case that we're going to use it, it's going to be a linear address space. So it's basically just a set of contiguous, non-negative integer addresses. So the set 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth up to m minus 1 would be a linear address space. We're going to have two of these address spaces. We've been talking about virtual addresses and physical addresses, and we want to be able to distinguish the two address spaces in which those addresses live. So a virtual address space, and we're going to use the letter N to indicate the virtual address space. It's going to be a power of two virtual addresses. Not going to be surprising to you to learn that. 
ranging from 0 to n minus 1. And then the physical address space, we're going to continue to use m to refer to that. And again, it's a power of two of physical addresses from 0 to m minus 1. So keep an eye out for those letters. We're going to try to use those consistently through the illustrations that are shown in the next few slides. Why are we thinking about this? Why do we care about virtual memory? I kind of gave you some idea about it before, that it allows us to have what amounts to a larger amount of memory available to our programs, even though physical memory on the computer might be limited. The ability to use memory efficiently is really kind of a key thing here. We're going to use DRAM, the main memory in the computer, as a cache for parts of the virtual address space. Another reason that we do this is it makes memory management easier. It turns out, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, it turns out that every process that's running on a machine that uses virtual memory essentially gets to behave as if it's the only process on the machine and every process has the same virtual address space. That makes a ton of things more convenient, like linking together programs, figuring out where you're going to load them into memory. Because they all have their own virtual address space, you can just continue to treat them as if they're the only thing running on the computer. It also provides isolation between these address spaces. So for example, if you have two different processes that are running simultaneously on the same machine, because they're isolated into their own virtual address spaces, they can't access each other's memory. This was a huge problem in the past where you didn't have virtual memory, you didn't have memory management, and if you had two programs that were running in the same machine at the same time, they could literally read and write each other's storage locations and clobber each other. Or if you had one program that went haywire, it could wreck other programs that were percolating along perfectly fine. Uh, it also allows us to do some access control between user programs and the operating system itself. So the operating system kernel is going to have a control over all of the memory of the machine and the individual user programs that shouldn't have elevated privileges like the operating system has are going to be isolated into their own virtual memory spaces. Let's look in more detail at this idea of using virtual memory as a way to do caching. We're going to see here on the left that virtual memory is essentially an array of these n bytes that are going to be stored on disk. And it turns out that we're not going to be reading information back and forth from disk in individual bytes at a time. We're going to want to be able to bring in larger blocks, larger chunks than that, in the same way that we bring in cache lines that are larger than a single byte when we're talking about caching in the CPU. So these illustrations here are intended to, to convey the notion of pages. So a virtual page 0, virtual page 1, up to the last page in virtual memory. And those pages can be in one of several states on disk. They can either be unallocated, we're not using them, or they can be cached. In other words, they've been brought into physical memory at some point. Or they can be allocated but not cached. So they haven't yet been requested by the processor to bring them into physical memory where it has access to them. So these pages, we're going to use capital P to indicate their size. And again, they're going to be powers of 2 in size. When the processor requests access to a location in the virtual address space that hasn't yet been pulled in from disk into memory, it's going to cause a full page from disk to be brought into memory into a page that's the same size here on the physical memory side. So here we've got physical page 0, physical page 1, up to the last physical page, and this represents the locations from address 0 to m minus 1. So these are the physical pages, and these are the virtual pages. Let's think of some of the implications of using DRAM as a cache. We know, for example, that DRAM, that makes up main memory, is going to be about a factor of 10 slower than the SRAM in the CPU chip, and that the disk itself is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 times slower than DRAM. So if we're thinking about using DRAM as a cache, we have to recognize, first of all, that there is a huge miss penalty associated with this. If the processor issues a request for a virtual address and the physical memory associated with that virtual address hasn't been brought into the DRAM yet, there's going to be a very long delay while the virtual memory system goes out to disk, fetches that entire page in, stores it into physical memory, and updates the mapping between virtual and physical addresses. So we'd really like to not pay that penalty very often. As a result, some of the design choices that are typically made in a virtual memory system are, first of all, we're going to use a relatively large page size. So the number of bytes that we're going to be reading in to be able to satisfy these memory requests is going to be pretty good sized. Often it's a 4K page, but sometimes in different machines it's as many as 4 megabytes. 
Again, thinking about this as a cache, we're going to make this fully associative. So that was basically the ability to have any address go into any line of the cache when we were thinking about the CPU. And the same thing obtains here. We're going to be able to load any virtual page into any physical page in memory. In order to make that all work, we're going to employ some fairly sophisticated algorithms that are too complex to be implemented in hardware. So the kernel takes on responsibility for this process of moving information back and forth between memory and the disk. We're also going to make use of a write back approach. Remember that write back means that we're only going to flush the contents of a particular layer of the memory hierarchy to the next lower level when the layer of interest is about to be evicted. And that's what's going to be done for the physical pages in memory. If you think about that, we want to maintain those pages in memory as long as we can, even if they're being updated by the program that's running on the processor. It's only when we need to evict that particular page that we want to finally take the time and pay the cost of flushing that information back out onto the disk. The fact that the kernel is going to do all of this movement of information back and forth between physical memory and virtual memory on disk means that we have to have some way of keeping track of what's being mapped to what. And the enabling data structure that makes that possible is something called a page table. So in this illustration, I've kind of simplified the representations of the physical and virtual memory. So physical memory, I'm just showing up here as just four pages. And for virtual memory, I'm showing these pages. The job of the page table is basically to keep track in the kernel of which pages in the virtual address space are mapped to what locations in physical memory. And here's the structure of that table. We've got multiple page table entries. I'm only showing eight entries in our simple page table here. And each of those entries has two pieces. One is a valid bit, and that's similar to the notion of a valid bit in a cache line. It basically says, is the entry in this page table valid or not? The other part of each page table entry is a reference to either the physical memory or the virtual memory, or it's an empty entry. And you can see here that some of the entries here in my page table are referring to pages in DRAM, the physical memory locations, and others are referring to locations in virtual memory out on disk. Let's look at what happens when the processor requests values from a particular virtual address. In this new illustration, we can see that I've added a virtual address coming from the CPU core to the memory management unit. The MMU is going to treat this virtual address as having two components in the same way that a regular cache entry has the tag bits, the set bits, and the block offset. We're going to have a similar sort of a thing here with the virtual address where we're going to segment that off into the page number, the upper bits, and then the location within that page, which are going to correspond to the lower bits. And we're going to talk about that in much more detail in another talk. The topmost bits in this virtual address are basically going to allow the memory management unit to select an entry in the page table. And what I'm showing here is that the, the bits in the virtual address at, at, at the top are going to pick out page table entry number two, so 0, 1, 2. What the MMU is going to find there is that this particular page table entry has the valid bit set, which means that the contents of the entry are going to refer to a location in physical memory that contains the particular virtual page of interest. So the virtual address is asking for page number two. The page table entry for page two is valid, and it refers to memory that contains all of the bytes for that particular page. So the MMU is going to go to this location in memory, and it's going to fetch back the appropriate bytes according to the lower bits of this address, the offset within that page, and it's also going to take into consideration the size of the operand. Is it a quad word or a long word and so forth? And then return those bytes back to the CPU from that location in memory. Because the virtual address referred to a page that was already in the page table, we'd call this a page hit in the same way that when we were thinking about the CPU, we had cache hits and cache misses. This is a page hit. One final thing to note here is that the locations of the virtual pages in RAM is not constrained at all. And when we were saying before that we can store any virtual page in any physical page, that's what we're talking about. Although the page table itself is going to be in a fixed location in memory, because each of the entries in the page table could point to arbitrary locations throughout main memory, we can bring in the virtual pages into physical memory in any place we want. And that gives the algorithm that's worrying about page replacement quite a lot of flexibility in how it manages main memory. Let's take a look then at a page fault. 
So this is the case where we are going to have a miss in the virtual address lookup. So same idea here. We're going to look up a virtual address. We're going to use the top bits of this address to choose a page table entry. And unlike the previous request where we went to page table entry number two and we actually had content in physical memory, we're going to go to page table entry number three, which we can see right away is invalid. The valid bit is clear. And in that case, what we're going to do is point to the location out on disk where that particular page currently lives. So we're accessing page table entry number three, and we can see that this value in the page table points to a location on disk that contains virtual page number three. So what's going to happen then is that the operating system and the memory management unit are going to collaborate together to raise an exception, basically saying, hey, the program is trying to access this virtual memory location and it's not in physical memory yet. That will cause the running program to be temporarily suspended and then the processor can go off and do some other things. But before that happens, it's going to issue a request to the disk controller to go out to this location on disk and pull that data back into memory. At, that, at the time that that's completed then, the information necessary for this particular process to continue will be in memory and then it will be re-enabled to run the next time the operating system chooses to run it. Now there's a issue here with bringing in the page that's being requested into main memory. As we can see here with our little tiny collection of physical pages, we're already using all of the pages that we have available to us. So the first thing we need to do is figure out which of these pages are we going to evict. And arbitrarily here I've indicated that we've chosen this page table entry PP3, physical page 3. Uh, we're going to basically take that and we're going to write it out to disk. This is that write back behavior that I was talking about before because while virtual page 4 was in physical memory, whatever processes were accessing that page might have made changes to it. So if there have been any updates to the contents of this memory, we want to make sure that it gets pushed back out to disk and that we keep track of where it now lives on disk. At that point then we can push the contents of virtual page 4 back out to the disk and bring in the contents of virtual page 3. And we can see that happening here in the next page. Notice that the page table entry for page table entry 3 is now pointing to main memory and refers to the block that was pulled in from disk. And page table 4, which was the one that we evicted back here, is now referring to the location of virtual page 4 on disk. There's the before case. We've got page table 4 in memory and page table 3 out on disk. And now the after case, we've got page table entry 3 in memory and page table 4 is pointing to data that's out on the disk. This is what's called demand paging. The idea here is that we're going to bring in pages from virtual memory out on disk into memory on demand when the program that's running needs to access a location in memory that's currently not mapped into physical memory from the virtual address space, that constitutes a demand to bring that page in from disk. As you can see, this whole virtual memory behavior works because of locality. So we've got locality to the rescue again. It's pretty clear that if you just think about the difference in performance between registers on the CPU and something that's out on rotating storage that's super slow, that this shouldn't really work at all. But it turns out that it really does because of locality. Programs not only tend to access addresses that are nearby one another, either in space or in time, as we talked about with respect to caching in memory, they also tend to have a larger locality in the sense that they're going to be using data or instructions from nearby pages in the virtual address space. That's called the working set. The more temporal locality that we have means that we're going to have a smaller working set. So if you've got a bunch of programs that are running on the same machine and they all have good temporal locality, they're only going to be using a small amount of physical memory because those are going to be the pages containing the code and data being accessed by the program at any given point in time. If we think about kind of what are the impacts of this working set, we can see that if the working set size is way smaller than the memory size, we're going to end up with good performance on every process. I've noted here also that that's going to be true after the working set gets into memory. So when the program first starts running, it's not going to have any of those pages loaded into memory. 
it's going to rely on demand paging to bring them into physical memory as the program starts running. So we'll see there's going to be a fair number of page faults right away as a program starts up. But as it gets going and gets into the part of the program that's demonstrating good locality, its working set will then be in memory. It won't have to go out to disk to fetch in any additional pages. On the other hand, if the sum of all the working set sizes is larger than main memory, what's going to happen is every time we switch from one process to another, we're going to have to be swapping information out of main memory out to disk and bringing in a different page from disk into main memory. If that gets too extreme, we enter into what's called thrashing. We're basically just spending all of our time swapping pages back and forth between disk and memory, and the processor never has a chance to actually run the programs. It's too busy spending its time in the operating system pulling pages in and out of memory. Another use for virtual memory is to do memory management. We've kind of alluded to this already in terms of the virtual address spaces that are available to each process, but let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So here's an illustration that shows two processes. Here's the first one, and it's got a virtual address space going from address 0 to n minus 1. And I've just shown kind of two page table entries here that are of interest. And then a virtual address space for process 2, which also goes from 0 to n minus 1. Again, both of these processes think they're the only thing on the computer that's running at any given time, and they're allocated the same set of virtual addresses. It's up to the memory management unit and the operating system to actually map those pages from the virtual address space into physical addresses. In this case, what we're showing here is that virtual page number one from process one refers to this location in physical memory, so physical page two. And similarly, virtual page number one in the second process refers to physical page eight over here. But we're also showing that virtual page two in both processes are actually mapped to the same physical page. It turns out that if the contents of a particular physical page has not been modified by any process, that that page itself can be shared among multiple processes, thereby reducing the amount of physical memory we're going to have to allocate. So as long as multiple processes are only reading from a particular page, we can continue to leave that page shared by multiple processes, using the memory management unit to map that same physical page into different virtual pages in the different processes. If any of these processes decides to change a value to write to this memory page, then the operating system and the memory manager are also going to get into the picture, and they're going to make a duplicate of this page to allow the two virtual address spaces to have their own physical pages under the hood.